Hello everyone, and welcome to the Lobster Roll series week 9. Final week for the Lobster Roll series. I'm your host, Dominic or Shadow Pure, whichever you prefer. And we have the biggest tournament so far. It has 18 players. So we're going to be running in basically round 16 from the start. Or sorry, 17 players. I got too excited. But yeah, round 16 from the start. We are starting with Bloa and Ted McFred going at it. And they have already started to ban the maps. And so far we do have a different set of maps. So some of them from before, Anvilwood, Zed, Vantage. But then others, Ravage, Stavrosaurus, Sparkles Reef, we haven't seen yet. Scaryland, I think, was in a previous map, map pool as well. But yeah, a lot of stuff has been different. So Zed is out, Ravage is out, and now it comes down to the pick. It's up to Bloa to figure out what... Wait, no, it's up to Time to figure out what they want. Anyway, Ted McFred should have the map pick, and knowing them, they're likely to go for Vantage, I would think, just because it is the, I think, the tank-orientedest map. I guess Savage Shores might work, though. It's the dry version, so you don't have to worry about having to go Hovercraft. But I don't think they're going to want to go up those ramps. And Scary Land, I don't, I don't see it for tanks, just because that's not a map which... It's not a map that really allows for a lot of units to be swarming around. Oh wait, no, that would be good for tanks. What am I saying? I don't know, I still feel like it would cut the mobility. But we are indeed going to see Scaryland. That is exactly what Ted McFred wants. So, Scaryland it is. Anyway... We are... Actually, I think we... Have we seen Scary Land in this tournament? I feel like that's a new one, too. I'd have to double-check the footage from previous tournaments, but I, I think that's not something we've actually encountered before. So, yeah, we are going to be getting Scary Land. As our first map on our first match of the last week of the Lobster Roll series. I am curious, though, what Ted is going to do here. Because, again, they are a tank specialist, but this is a very rampy map. This isn't a map that really allows for a huge amount of maneuvering. I mean, Fairyland was definitely a bit more forgiving in that regard, but not Scary Land so much. I'm... Yeah, I'm really curious how this is going to pan out. Just waiting on blow. There we go. All right. Let's get going with a new map. So yeah, with Scary Land, I'm expecting Blow to go for... What was Blow's typical thing? Does Blow have a typical thing? I don't think Blow's a typical thing. I kind of expect they're going to go for... For Cloak or Shield. But I don't know. So, Blow over in the northeast, 10 in the southwest. Ted, what are you doing? What will you be doing? You will be doing Rovers! Alright, some variation. I like to see it. I mean, actually, okay, it's not entirely true. I do like to see factory specialists being able to do their thing, but it's, I don't know, factories don't work quite like factions in most RTS games, so I can see, you know, you, you have to swap out. It's just how it works sometimes. Anyway. So, row we're starting out for Ted. Actually, very economical. Two Masons off the bat on a map like Scaryland. That is... That is a really fast expansion. Holy crap. On the other hand, blow a gun for something proxy here. What do they got planned out? Low ground rovers. Okay, not really proxy. Just want to avoid the ramps. That I can understand. Time Fred, though, really keen on getting as much energy reclaim as they can. It's worth noting, this is energy reclaim, not metal reclaim. There is, as you can see from the lack of any reclaim overlays... There's no metal reclaim in these trees. But energy reclaim is still useful. That still means you don't have to build as many power plants early on. You can focus on metal extractors and whatever else you need. 
So Tim McFred's idea is still wise. It's just a little bit unorthodox. You're right, Ted, going for basically nothing military. On the other hand, Loa already starting with a couple Scorchers, just sending them out around to see what's going on. Actually, one for scouting, one defense. But the scouting one should find there's not a whole lot of resistance, just, just Lotuses. Yeah, Ted McFred is relying entirely on static defense to hold out their main base and then just get energy and get overdrive. Build up slowly. I'm not sure that they needed two Masons, but I can sort of see the logic. You essentially have a commander. They have the commander up front, which has the Lotus and like, the built-in laser and everything else, and so it can defend itself. And then you have a commander's worth of build power in the base with the two Masons. So that way you still basically have the build power of the commander, or for Ted McFred being that they're more used to tanks, the build power, a little more than the build power of a welder in your base while your commander moves out to continue expanding. Loa, on the other hand, just went forward. Like, one mason, have the commander up front, basically expand out very rapidly by having the factory close enough to the expansion that defense becomes easier, and having this back of Scorcher just in case. So Bloa definitely... They're definitely pulling ahead far faster than Ted McFred is in terms of economy. Largely because they, Ted McFred far more focused on getting power going. Blow on the other hand, not too concerned about that. A few solars just to keep them in the game until they get the Geo up. Which, yeah, that kind of makes sense. So really, Blow is playing a bit more of the long game here. While also playing the short game. They're, they're kind of covering all angles of this game right now. They've they had the economy to last, to, or they had the military to set up a strong opening in their corner. They have the economy base to set up a really strong mid-game. The only thing that they're gambling on is timing, because they're kind of running out of energy all that they can reclaim. But yeah, it's a question of how long is this geothermal plant going to take compared to how long it takes for their army to be built, and then from there, how long is it going to take for their opponents to come in and potentially wreck face if they so choose. At any rate, Bloa now has having to contend with Ted McFred, pushing out a little more aggressively. I mean, Ted McFred definitely is starting at the army they can use to basically hit any point. They have the economy, or the masons they'd need to expand rapidly anywhere on the map. So, I'm seeing Ted McFred really starting to explode right now, where Bloa is going to have to start making full use of that geothermal plant's overdrive. Set up a pylon in a couple spots, or set up pylons all over, really, and then use that to keep going from there. The one thing going for Blow right now is Ted McFred is not setting up caretakers. They're starting to access a little bit when they're not building metal extractors. Forced to upgrade the commander as well, though admittedly given how forward that commander is, upgrading it is pretty well mandatory anyway. And that is, that is a very aggressive commander right now. Bloa, on the other hand, is just... They're prepping for war. They are just getting ready fencers, scorchers. Pretty well equipped for what they've seen thus far, which has just been mass scorchers. Though, if we did see a changeover to Ripper Ravager, the fencers might start running... Well, the scorchers run into problems defending the fencers, and the fencers would run into problems from Ted McFred's scorchers. For the time being, though, it's... Pretty well, Bloa holding this corner quite strongly, but Ted McFred rapidly taking the rest of the map, which is going to translate into a very large army for Ted McFred very shortly. Bloa, on the other hand, like I said, it's always been about timing, and that is where they are going to take their advantage. They know they have the unit count, they know they have the unit composition. They just need to find the right place to attack where it has not been sufficiently well defended. Oh. Not bad there. I mean, that's... Actually, didn't lose a Scorcher on Bloa's side, so Ted McFred in a lot of trouble. Three... Three Rove... Or three Lotuses won't be enough to stop all of these Scorchers coming in here. Even the Commander coming in with the Light Particle Beam. It's not enough. Ted McFred's Commander is going to go down very shortly. Stardust being built, but it's simply not built fast enough. Ted McFred's Commander goes down. The Stardust soon follows. A little bit overly aggressive with that Commander, I'm afraid. Econ Commander is not a forward Commander. 
as Ted McFred has learned. However, Ted McFred is still well ahead economically. They're a bit behind in terms of energy, but again, Reclaim exists. But they are not so hot when it comes to their army. Again, Bloa already had an army advantage. They did lose a few of them to death explosions in that fight, but even with that, Bloa still has the army advantage. Ted McFred is still coming in kind of at a major disadvantage. Luckily for them, the wind decided to pick up right then and there. But it comes down to, does Ted McFred have the capacity? No, they don't have the, they don't have the production! That's the problem. If Ted McFred had a couple of caretakers, they would be totally in the clear. They could completely rebuild their army, get like Ripper Ravager, and just wipe out everything that Bloa has built up. But Bloa is not going to go down that easily, simply because they are using their metal. Ted McFred... They're managing to use it kind of across the map, but they're not using it to reduce an army. And that that is exactly what Blow has taken advantage of. Getting rid of another metal extractor, getting rid of the masons up front. I mean, the masons are desperately trying to use that build power, but honestly, you've got to use it on the factory. Build plates or build caretakers. you got to do something with that, or else your army is simply not going to survive. We see already in the battle in the center of the map here, a few masons are going down from Blow's side, but that's not helping. At the cost of all the Scorchers, and at the same time... Scorches coming in from Bloa are wiping out Ted McFred's expansions, destroying masons that have been trying to spend all this metal that Ted McFred had built up. But none of it's working. Ted McFred would actually be in a really good position if it weren't for the fact that their factory is simply not producing fast enough. They don't have caretakers being built up, and I honestly don't understand why. That is the thing that's killing them. That's that if like that's why they're out of this game. That, that's it. They could not use the metal they had to build the army they needed to fend off Bloa's assault, and now that's just going to be game. Time Fred desperately trying to just rapid Lotus, but it's... I don't see it. Lotus simply isn't strong enough against all these Scorchers coming in, getting rid of the Masons. It's a valiant effort, but nothing's going to happen until a Caretaker is done, and this is honestly too little too late. Ted McFred's only saving grace is that Bloa has not been expanding rapidly behind this, but unfortunately for them, Bloa has been reclaiming rapidly behind this. So ultimately, the economic gain from Bloa's side has just been as strong. Bloa could rapidly transition into a solid economy, use that just to reinforce this army, while Ted McFred simply doesn't have any way of building it up. Finally, one character does come up. They've already lost 10 metal per second from what they had. They already lost the metal advantage they had. So it is too little too late indeed. Ted McFred realizing this, throws in the towel, and Bloa takes it, moving on to the winner's quarterfinals. Nicely done, Bloa. Yeah, Ted McFred, that kind of came down to, you know, metal used. Metal used was better than Bloa, but if you look at army value, Bloa just completely blew Ted out of the water. I mean, pretty much all capacities blow was kind of just running rough right over Ted McFred. Granted, like, defense and economy, Ted McFred was definitely outspending, but that was the problem. They didn't have army. So, that metal usage, yeah, it's great. There wasn't any excess, there was basically no excess, but uh, not good enough. It's really not good enough when you can't defend your base as a result. So that was that. The... Next match is... I'm just going to do a few more before we move on. So, for those of you who are maybe wondering, I'm going to be going on to the winner's quarterfinals before... Like, finish up winner's quarterfinals before we start... Before we go to a break. Although, admittedly, we're starting to get winner's quarterfinals matches, it looks like. Like, Randy and Bakahatsu are going... But we will have to finish all winner's quarterfinals before winner's semis start. I don't really want to miss Randy and Bakahatsu. So we won't. We're going straight to that. Basically jumping up to the winner's quarterfinals. As it has just started. Yeah, Blow Up, as you can see, we'll be fighting the winner of Pudis and Ted Pudis and Fruity. And we are on Ravaged for this match between Randy and Bakuhatsu. And are both players going spiders? Nah, spiders and Amph. 
curious choice on this map. Ducks have been, n well, nerfed-ish slightly. Their, their range on their rockets is a little bit slower than it used to be. Overall, though, that's still a pretty solid factory. Randy with the spiders makes a lot more sense considering all the cliffs, and we are seeing this weaver just hanging out up top. Doesn't really care. Nice little rev export. Overall, Randy starting out fairly strong. Bakuatsu expanding a little bit more slowly, but... Looks like they're trying to immediately switch over to skirmishers just to counter spiders. Understandable. However, that does kill a lot of their spe whatever speed they might have had. I mean, speed advantage, honestly. Amphibots aren't that fast. But what speed they might have had is somewhat sacrificed for the boys. I expect Bakatsu is going to be trying to limit expansion over to the southeast and northwest. You already see the ducks are hanging out by the northwest ramp. One's already by the ramp leading to the southeast from the commander, so at least they know the commander's coming in. But that is not going to stay. I mean, Randy's commander basically able to go through without issue. I think Bakabatsu is aware of it, but basically can't do anything about it. Just don't have the resources, don't have the army. Randy's just a little bit too scary, although right now Randy's actually really vulnerable. There aren't a whole lot of defenses built around the map. There's the one redback, which the boy is essentially designed to counter, and... There's there's not much else. Reckless trying to come in and deal with the boy, but is not going to have much success. Weaver does manage to get away, though. That is that is going to be the key thing. That Weaver can survive, then... Well, anything that gets lost can be easily rebuilt. But speaking of, though, Bakabatsu is making sure there are losses. Randy is, however, still setting up. I mean, they've... They got the northwest, they got the... Or, the, yeah, northwest, they got the southeast. Basically got everything to their name. So, this is going to be a question of what... What Bakuatsu can do to try to catch up, because they've been behind economically this entire game. And army-wise, they're not doing too bad, they haven't really gotten into any fights. It's just... Doesn't seem likely it's going to last that long. Reckless is continuing to pour in, and that's going to make the boys' lives increasingly difficult. Not sure why the archer decided to do that, but that was the end of it. Conscious well, not able to stand. Did try to hold, hunker down, but there was no way out for that conch, unfortunately. Bakuhatsu just gradually losing units left and right. Unfortunately, I don't think this matchup is really great for them, but they did get rid of the Weaver. No, sorry, that's the Reckless. My bad, I misidentified the unit. They did make it pretty clear that maybe some silhouette modification is in order for the spider units, because it's hard to identify sometimes. They did however now get rid of the Weaver, so there's at least a bit more hope for pushing this area, but at the same time... Randy's now got, like, twice their economy. Bakuat's at least punishing a bit of the naked expansion. It's just... It's gonna be difficult to turn that into actual... Well, any kind of actual advantage. I mean, Bakuatsu is so heavily on the back foot right now. They're desperately trying when it comes what, with winning off of basically any kind of unit type advantage, but it's just not really working out. Drones being that the one thing going in their favor. Another Weaver does go down. Boy, Oh, hey, boys, Archer's coming around the side, and not a whole lot of defenses set up. There is actually some hope with this. This assault force here over to the southeast. It's going for the commander, which I don't know... Well, I see. Yeah, it's got backup. Okay. So I, say, I don't really know why they're doing that. But no, I do I do know. There's forces coming from all sides. That commander... That commander is done. Randy's eastern presence has been heavily curtailed. Now this entire area over here can be completely wiped out. The western side is still under heavy threat. Bakabatsu looks to be losing their northwest expansion. Or the northwest pit expansion. While at the same time taking out Bakabatsu's eastern... Hill expansion, or Eastern Plateau expansion, so it's a bit of a trade. Bakabatsu is still behind. But Bakabatsu has a lot of expansions they can, or at least could. Stinger coming up is going to be a little more challenging. But they could at least have gone rid of. Interesting, switching over to Bulkheads, possibly as a bait for the Recluses. See, unfortunately for the for the Ampot Factory, the units aren't really that fast. Like, the Reckless Speed... 
Reckless Speed comes in at 45 elements per second. Archer comes in at 50... Uh, 70 is not that slow, but it's not that much faster. Especially as Bakabatsu really doesn't have the resources to invest that much into that. And the boys at the same time have 51. Yeah, it's basically the same speed. I mean, skirmishers typically have roughly the same speed. Oh, but the Weaver does go down! The Stinger is no longer a threat, or at least not until another Weaver comes in. This boy's actually doing some work! There we go! Randy's starting to, starting to hurt in their back lines. Quite the valuable push right there. Just wind generator after wind generator, and Bakabatsu's front line has stabilized. Bulkhead's coming in here. Helping get rid of some of these units. Oh, and the red pack goes down. That actually opens things up if they want. Oh, well, if they had anything to follow up any raiders. But still, that red back is dead. Not a whole lot of anti-raider protection on the north side. And on the back lines, the boys really wrecking face. I mean, that's what they. I mean, getting rid of red backs is what they do. But getting rid of everything else like this is surprisingly effective. Just get rid of all the wind generators. Not sure if micro, but definitely effective. So Randy absolutely punishing the overly aggressive expansion coming in here from... Sorry, Bakabatsu punishing the Randy's overly aggressive expansion. Bakabatsu attempting to rebuild on that terrain, though. Having a bit more trouble. But Randy's hubris has been to some degree punished. Conch trying to set up in the middle of a war zone. Having having second thoughts about that pretty clearly. I don't think they're going to be able to escape, though. No, that conch does not manage to get out of backup. Backup, however, has been dispatched. Should be able to reclaim whatever Bakabatsu needs to get themselves back on track. Though, granted, if we look at the army value right now, I'm not entirely confident. Yeah, Bakabatsu's army value is 1270 compared to 4900, almost 5000. I mean, Bakabatsu has definitely been doing well on type counter matchups, but even then, the bulkheads have only lasted so long. Fortunately, though, there's no Recluse. I mean, really, Ducks could just come in here and start taking it out. Ducks, for a speed reference... Okay, they're, they have double the speed of Recluses. They have no problem approaching them. Now, without Redbacks actually being a threat, those Ducks could just run right in. Although, I'm not sure if... No, I don't think Bakabatsu is aware of that. Yeah, Bakabatsu is not entirely aware that the Recluses aren't... Or rather, because this are the only thing to worry about. But with the Redbacks gone from that fight, yeah, it's... Or nearly gone. One remains, but boys exist to deal with it. And the Bulkhead exists to deal with it. And the Ducks are going in to take care of the Recluses. And the Recluses actually are surprisingly good anti-raiders. So, yeah, that explains why the Ducks weren't being pushed forward. Never mind. Forgot the sheer volume of missiles kind of makes up for the inaccuracy. I'm struggling to think of what could be done in this situation. I mean, I guess maybe Lobster Scallop, but that's a lot of investment for this one particular matchup. I mean, Ducks are struggling. Archers likely aren't going to have an easy time. Though, Lobbed Ducks... There's the attempt. Lobbed Ducks coming in here. The Rexes don't have a whole lot of chance. Or at least so I thought. Now, the Rexes' firing angle is just low enough. They don't have to worry about it. Granted, each recluse is 280 metal compared to the ducks 80. So, even if it takes three ducks to kill a recluse, that's still worth it. Regardless, though, Randy has taken the entire map. Bakabatsu, unfortunately, having not quite been able to punish that expansion quickly enough, and unfortunately, not really having a lot of great options against, against spiders, to be perfectly honest. I, yeah, I can't say I'm surprised. Fought hard, though, and I really like that raid around the back. But, unfortunately, just wasn't enough. Like, not when Randy just has the force, like, has the economy to build up these super expensive skirmishers. Although, to be fair, boys are the same cost. But again, ducks are a lot cheaper. I mean, ducks and a few lobsters can help, but, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm really not sure how you'd get rid of all these recklesses with antbots. Like, if ducks don't work, and they clearly don't, there's not a whole lot of options. So, yeah, Randy takes it. Largely just by getting a very rapid metal income, very rapid naked expansion, and then 
defending it well enough to turn it into a strong enough army to win. So yeah, that was that. Anyhow, we're going to be moving on to a match between Pudis and Bloa. Pudis did win against Root against Fruity. So let's go check back on Bloa and see how they do in this round. Let's see, where is Pudis and Bloa? Oh dear, it's already been running. All right. Well, we're going to be having to switch back to that real quick because it is currently in process. It's, it's currently happening. It's, it's not... Can't really wait for it. And Spider coming from Pudis and Bloa going for Cloakie. A bit more of a reasonable choice as a spider counter. Put is nowhere near as aggressively expansionistic as Randy was. Blow, however, getting a little bit too cocky themselves. Then it was over to the north side, taking them out, but they can only do so much. Or so it seems, going around the main base and taking it out. Mass Venom Rush. Put is taking it, moving on to the winner's semis. That I did not expect. But there you go. Mass Venom Rush just takes the cake. What was the what were the stats on Metal, uh, metal Use Pudis' little head? Metal Income Pudis was largely behind. But yeah, army value... Oh, right, because Blow moved most of their army out south while the, while the Venoms were attacking. So they were way out of position to actually stop the Venoms from coming in. Allowing the Venoms to take the game. So, that was that. That was... That was short. Oh, whoops. Yeah. All right. Well. What else have we got here? We should have... Let's see. Oh, Dan Warren FFC will be starting right now. All right, we can actually get into another map banning phase. Everyone loves map banning phase. Now, I'm kind of worried the YouTube description isn't going to have enough room for this. Because we're doing Dan Warren FFC and probably also... I might have split this in two. I might have to split this in two. I'm not 100% sure because it's just... I think it's going to be an issue with YouTube description lengths. Eh, it's not a big deal. I've only been doing this for, what... Half an hour? Yeah, no, I almost split it in half. A lot of games going on, but that's it. Okay, so where's Dan Warren FFC? Where's Dan Warren FFC? Hmm. All right, well, I'm going to have to go to Golda versus Crow. Ow. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with Dan Warrior FFC. I think Dan Warrior is here. Yeah, Dan Warrior is here. Nah, whatever, I'm... Wait, I feel like I'm wasting time now. I just wanted to do the quarterfinals, but they aren't starting yet. Ah, uh, forget it. We'll watch Cro Golden and Crow. Oh, we're going on Z. Okay. That's uh, been decided already. We're doing Z. 
Glitter versus Crow. Oh, apparently Dan Warren FFC already fought. Well, okay, that was that was completed. All right, that explains everything. I'm a little, I'm a little reluctant to have that go through, just because I would like to wait on the semis. The Randy's right here, so they're not going to play semis right now. Oh, Ravage, Zed, Sapphire, Scaryland have been banned. I was misinformed. I had to jump in this and okay, Ravage, Zed. So Anvil Woods in, Sparkles is in, Vantage is in. Okay. <sighs> So Vantage, Anvil, Winter Sparkles, we are on Vantage! Okay, that's way more sensible. I hate Zed. <laughs> I hate Zed with a passion. So we're on Vantage. We're on a good map. I apologize to the person who made Zed. But frankly, I expect you to apologize to me. <laughs> that's a joke, by the way. But yeah, we are going to be moving on to Vantage. Golda versus Crow. Oh! Oh, Dan and FC haven't actually fought yet. Well... They can do it whenever they want. I'm not... I'm not waiting on them. Doing Crow versus Golda. Oh, and also this is winner's round of 16 again. Because Crow's game is the one game that was not in round 16. Okay, FFC is just being slow. Yeah, I noticed that earlier when there. I wanted to do FFC versus Madcraft because Madcraft, Madcraft's a mad lad and tried to stay up all night practicing before the tournament started. Though I, they, we managed to convince them to actually have some sleep. But I wanted to watch them play against FFC. Actually, I wanted to play against them before the tournament started, but I myself was too tired, so I had to I sleep in a bit just to make sure I had enough energy to actually do a good casting job. And. Yeah, I kind of wanted to play them before the tournament started, but also, yeah, that I wanted to cast them, and FFC wasn't there. So I'm not sure what's going on. And apparently that is just happening now, too. So FFC is... I mean, it doesn't matter a huge amount, since we are still waiting on Golden and Crow, and then the winner of that versus Thomas. Although, admittedly, it's not the biggest deal, because when we do the semifinals, it would just do one or the other. All right, well, Crow's got this all set up. Got Hover on Cloaky. Okay, Crow going for center expansion. I don't... I don't know. That's... that's I guess the thing you can do. Against Gorda, that's super risky, but let's see what happens. So... Starting out immediately with Dagger. Code on the other hand, starting immediately with a Conjurer. Because why not? Set the Conjurer up, get it going. Get a few mexes up. Golda clearly not concerned about the early game, and I mean, I don't blame them. It's a general rule in an RTS game, a stronger player is usually going to focus more on an economic play, just because they're better equipped to manage the larger resources, larger number of units. Increased speed of production and overall increased scope of the game than the weaker player. So generally, if, especially in lopsided matches, the weaker player is going to want to go for a really quick cheese or really quick rush or anything like that. Hyper aggressive play, which Crow is known to do, while the stronger player is likely to stick to more safe play that takes some setup. Yeah, unfortunately for them, though, that... Yeah, the hovercraft coming in there, that's going to be a problem. Going up the ramps, that is. That, that's going to be a challenge. We look here... Yeah, it's like... Eh. 
The red is when it's slow. The hovercraft finally getting into the base, however. Or the daggers, rather, getting into the base. And we'll at least deal some damage, but they are going to have to contend with quite a few glaives, and Golda is a master at micro. I mean, they know dagger micro is supposed to work, and they're also just generally strong at unit micro in general, so they are probably going to be able to out-micro Crow right now. Crow the second group of daggers. Waiting in the wings, not sure if that's meant to be reinforcements or meant to be a flanking force. Either way, it is currently idle. Oof, and there we go. Gorda. Getting some nice peeling away there. I like it. Yeah, th this this dagger's dead. This dagger's dead. All the daggers are dead. Gorda has managed to completely reclaim control of their territory. Has quite the, the glaive army to show for it. Now it's going to be... I don't know what it's going to be, honestly. Crow coming with six daggers. Might be able to get rid of a few glaives, but honestly, Gorda is just playing it safe. Continuing to build up more glaives, but honestly, Gorda managing to get an economic advantage. They're building up throughout all this. While Crow... I mean, they're, they're managing to build up a little bit, but it's simply not that much. Most of what they're built up is what they planned in the pregame. While Gorda just continuing to adapt and expand and get more and more glaives killed, actually. There's maybe some hope here for Crow. Getting rid of a lot of the glaives at home, but it's not nearly enough. Not even a single metal extractor goes down, and the wind generators that have gone down are being quickly rebuilt. No excess happening. Golda has lost nothing as a result of this, but gained a few hundred metal worth of reclaim. At the same time, Golda expanding this entire time, while Crow struggling to maintain their economy, especially when their quills are being harassed. Crow having lost all of their army in their desperate attempts to destroy Golda's base. Now they are stuck on the back foot defending. And I just don't see this working out easily. Honestly, I'm surprised they haven't switched over to Volus. I mean, daggers are kind of handy for an Alpha Strike Force, but when you're dealing with this many glaives, maybe Volus, maybe Mace. No, oh, actually, Mace is too expensive. I don't know, one, no, 400, yeah, that's, that's 300 metal worth of glaives, so no. Volus is at least somewhat reasonable, but it's also probably not worth it. Yeah, Pudis. Pudis also pointing out the ramp thing I mentioned earlier. Yeah, like it, it's worth noting. This is eh, this is a bot map. This this is a bot map. There's just too many small hills for vehicles to work, and Gola didn't even really come down to that. Honestly, the daggers were in the main base. They simply weren't picking off glaze when they had the chance, and then they lost that chance very quickly. So yeah, Gola takes it, and we'll be moving on to the uh, tomorrow winners quarterfinals as Thomas Thomas and Gola. Thomas and Gata, man, this is gonna screw with my head. This is gonna screw with my head. Thomas and Golda are gonna be going at it. Though I think that took longer to get the map band sorted out than to get the game played. We'll see how Thomas works out in this because they are. I think a player that's come up very much. Let's look at the. Oh, you all cannot see the entire thing. No, they are not showing up on here. If they played before, they haven't won a single match. So they are going to be in a bit of a tight spot. Although they won one here against Flap. Well, anyway, that was that. So we're going to be moving on to... Unless I've seen Dan Warrior has started... Ah, it might have! It might have started! We are unravaged, in fact. Okay, well, Ravage is not a surprise to me. Ravage is a map that, honestly, is... To me, the most even map. Anvil Wood is very reclaim-focused, so if you're not confident, and it's very swingy that way. Vantage is fine. Scaryland is also fine. Both of them are... If you're not really wanting to play a bot game, or not really wanting to play a game where... Like a low macro bot game... It's not really going to help you very much. Actually, Scaryland works. We saw with Rovers works okay. Zed is Zed. Sparkles Reef is a sea map. And Sapphire Shores is massive, but also very hilly. So it doesn't quite have that same works for vehicles quality as, say, CCR, while being about the same size. It's, yeah, it, we're probably not going to see Sapphire Shores. But Ravaged. 
you know, there's there's a way you play Ravaged. Actually, I'm a bit surprised that we are seeing as much Ravaged as we are, because it's it has a very specific way of being played that oops, it's a very specific way of being played that honestly has been kind of solved. Man, that's why we're seeing a lot of spiders, and I expect we're going to see some jump bots as a counter to that to a to a degree. But overall, this map kind of fell out of popularity just because I think people kind of figured ways it kind of figured it had a pretty stale and narrow meta but at the same time that doesn't mean it's a safe map like people know how to play it which would explain why it's just sort of the map people are playing on it's you now it's a pretty it's a cozy map it's it's home it's nothing super fancy it's nothing super new it's just a map that everyone kind of knows how to play. You go for spiders, you play your spider game, you get a lot of metal extractors because it's a pretty high macro map, and then you just outplay your opponents with spiders. Then we're going for the quick venom, as is FFC. So the last game we saw very briefly was the Venom Rush. But the game before that was Spider and Amphbot, and I had a, Yeah, that was weird. I don't know if Amphbot has a counter to spiders on a map like this, or at all, or to Recluses specifically. I'd have to, they have to lab that out. Yeah, well, Ravage, <laughs> fine stuff in the chat pointing out, Ravage feels a bit mono spidery. Yes. Yes, that, that's, that is my point. That is my point exactly. Ravaged is kind of mono spidery. It's a map that really does favor spiders because the way the cliffs work. You, uh, jump, arguably, but jump is more expensive and harder to control. Spiders, you can throw fleas around the map and, well, do what Danware was trying to do and harass them behind. Arguably, it could work for other bots because there aren't that many cliffs and aren't that many hills and spiders don't get that great of an advantage from not having to worry about ramps. But you might as well go spiders. Like, there was a time, but then spiders got buffed. Like, redbacks were added, venoms got buffed, recklesses got their firing arcs a little bit more consistent so they're less likely to miss overall spiders got a massive set of buffs and a map like ravage is basically it's great for spiders and other factories it's like it's not as worth it you might as well just play spiders there's no reason not to at least none that come to mind immediately and certainly none that have become meta picks as counter picks to spider At any rate, Dan Warrior is falling behind, though. FFC getting out a little bit more of an economic advantage. Dan Warrior, not really sure what they're trying to do. I mean, there's not a whole lot of raiding going on. Just kind of exploring around the map. Slowly seeing what's up. Not really pushing out all that fast. Neither player really pushing out all that fast. I mean, we have... Bit of energy production in the main base. FFC with another Weaver that I expect will be going out to deal with the middle of the map. But this is still quite slow expansion. I mean, we saw the game with Randy earlier where by this point they had like a third of them. Like basically they had all of this to their name by three minutes into the game. Not so today. No, today both players are considerably more concerned about being raided out by their opponents. Though, granted... Randy was also playing against Amphbots, and Amphbots are kind of expensive and slow. So Randy might not be doing that kind of rapid expansion if they were fighting against another spider bot factory. At any rate, Dan Warrior is is still falling behind. They're still like FFC got another well weaver front, they're doing exactly what I expected, going building the center of the map. While also trying to clear out the rest of it so that this weaver probably wants to build a caretaker or two, we'll go out and start expanding over to the southeast. Dan Warrior, on the other hand, has a widow. Early widow going for FFC's commander. I don't really are they going for FFC's commander? I think they're just scouting. They can't be going for the commander yet. I mean, for one thing, I don't think they know the commander's even there. Yeah, they have no idea anything's built there. I think they're just using the widow to scout out. And the commander might get stunned. It won't amount to much. Yeah, okay, cool. The commander hasn't spotted. So yeah, scouting. It's all for scouting. 
Ah, I see. No, it is for the snipe. Venom comes in here. There's the Widow. FFC's commander should be okay, though. The Venom's coming in as backup. Yeah, yeah that's... That is a dead rec uh, That's a dead everything. Dan Warrior, solid attempt, but FFC had the backup forces. Was able to save their commander, and that was... That was a good thousand some odd metal trying to take out the commander. Oof, that's going to hurt Dan Warrior a lot. I mean, already you can see the attrition advantage. I mean, still, that was well set up. Like, that was well played. It's just, unfortunately, the Venoms were already in range. They were, they were already prepared to actually defend that commander in case anything happened. So with that, FFC has free reign over basically the entire map. One Venom on the cliffs trying to stop things, but it won't be enough. 1v4 Venoms, the Weaver won't even be able to get away. Red back from Denver are trying to save the day, but it's a question of can it actually deal enough damage? And it does not quite really manage to deal enough damage. It does get rid of a couple of the Venoms. Still, though, Denver maintains an 1,000 metal attrition advantage, and this Weaver desperately clinging to the side of the cliff, literally holding on for dear life. I mean, FFC could go down and harass it at any time, and unfortunately has gone up to its death. FFC coming down with the Venoms trying to stop it. But no, it's it will live. The Redbacks come in to defend. That Mason just barely makes it out alive. And now FFC is looking at a less pronounced economic advantage. This entire time, Dan Warrior has been expanding. They've gotten their little south southeast pit expansion. They're starting to get the center, although admittedly they're also starting to lose it. The Weaver has gone down to a bunch of Venom or to a couple of Venoms. But the Weaver that remained, now it's got Reclaim to work with. So Dan Warrior is not necessarily as far behind as they look. They're still kind of far behind. FFC has plenty to produce with. Dan Warrior's commander. Oof, that is unfortunate. They are getting taken out. And nothing is here to stop it. That is just a dead commander. At least the name is appropriate. Oh, whoa, it's not. Oh, I see what they're trying to do. Keep it stunned in the middle of the LLT. And, okay, now that worked. And we lost their commander. Did have the storage up, at least as a backup. But they are struggling with the Venoms. Just trying to get through those Venoms. Trying to actually deal enough damage. I almost wonder if Hermits would work well in this case. But I feel like just the mass Venom makes that very difficult to actually have... Like, the Venoms are fast, the Hermits are slow. The Redbacks are the DPS option here, but they do kite Venoms, so there's that. Flea's coming in, not sure why. As a distraction, they're not going to last long enough. And to get rid of the Red Recluses, they're not going to live long enough. Still, though, Dan Warrior is at least managing to somewhat stabilize the map half and half. FFC still has more Reclaim to work with. But... Mainly, oh yeah, the commander. Dan Warrior's commander, unfortunately, being reclaimed food for FFC. And Dan Warrior, I'm not sure why they're going out like this. Those, these, these Redbacks are way too frail. They, they did not have enough HP to go for an assault like that. I mean, Redcliffe is notwithstanding, those Redbacks were not anywhere near healthy enough to go for it. At any rate, the Venom's also rocking to their deaths. Redback's trying to kite. It's not really working. Several Venoms have died, though. Attrition is not even, however. FFC 3000 metal ahead on attrition on top of the economic advantage. The northwest base, or the plat western plateau base. Dan Weir is going to lose it. They're just trying to get that reclaim before they lose everything, because that's all they're going to get out of this base. Same time, the center of the map has been taken out as well. Not looking pretty for Dan Warrior right now. FFC going for an air switch. Going for owls. Probably going to go for... I don't know what you can go for. Same time Dan Warrior going for rover switch. Let's see. With rovers... What would you have? 
I suppose Ravagers would have enough HP to get through all that. Fencers, I feel like that's what's going to be built, but I don't think it's a good idea. The Venoms will be able to catch up to them and just kill them. But yeah, air plant, we have Owl, and then what? Are we going to get... Are we going to get Ravens? Are we going to get... Actually, Ravens would be a great idea. Send Ravens, like, five Ravens, or four or five Ravens, just wipe out all the Metal Extractors in two passes. Oh, Rippers. Okay, Rippers make sense, too. Not as much HP. Actually, no, Rippers don't make sense. You need to have something to tank the Venom Shots. Ripper Badger? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't agree with Ripper Badger. I'm really not seeing it. Okay, the crab. Okay, never mind. I missed the crab. Never mind. There is actually some potential. I mean, Ripper Badger is still questionable, but at least the crab is there to provide a little extra support, be a bit of a tank. But honestly, FFC's got a lot of map right now. They have a lot of map. They have everything. I'm going for more air units, but they have, they have the scouting. They need to figure out what the heck's going on and what to do about it. Man, yeah, the Rippers... Oh, man, Reckless is already in place. I mean, the Recklesses were in place to deal with the Redbacks. They're going to deal with the Rippers, no problem. That's kind of why I didn't see it. At least with Ravagers, you have the extra HP you can use to tank. Use that to tank. Like, cover for Rippers coming in to deal the damage. But Ripper... Ripper Badger? Like, yeah, I guess you're kind of covering with the artillery. If you have enough Badgers... It's just, if you're getting assaulted directly, you're screwed. Now, with Crab coming in, that seems likely to happen pretty soon. Although, it looks like FFC's air... Yeah, FFC's air source is entirely a bait. They have an owl. They spent a thousand metal to get an owl to force, so far, 660 metal worth of anti-air. On their opponent, who's already... Like, 5,000 metal attrition behind and has been floundering economically this entire game. I mean, it works. It's a bait. And that is that. So, FFC takes it pretty handily, honestly. I don't know if there was a whole lot of question there. I mean, it started out with some potential. The Flea's got some interesting licks in. From Dan Warrior. But overall, FFC just really tore things apart with those Venoms. And Dan Warrior never quite managed to catch up and never... Like, never really expanded that quickly either. FFC just expanded a little bit faster while also winning every fight. And that was that. So, with that, I think we have just one more match left in this round. And we've... Not even an hour yet. I <laughs> just did five matches, because why not? Oh, I'm sorry. That was Winter's Quarterfinals. That was Winter's Quarterfinals the entire time. Not round of 16. My bad. I don't know how to... I wish there was a way of automating that, but I don't think there was even a way of, like, conceptually automating that. Anyway. And it looks like Gorda and Thomas is about to start. Although, uh, I think... I don't know, is Randy... I don't know if I want to watch this, because Randy is going to be starting. And I kind of want to catch that. Like, Randy versus FSC is going to be starting pretty soon. Oh, I think, I think they won. Okay, so. In that case, we're going to be moving on to a short break. So stay tuned for that, and we will have, okay, Golda did in fact win. Alrighty. So, go to one and FFC one. We'll be moving on to the winner semis in just a few minutes, so stay tuned. <laughs> 